The text today is Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 9. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to focus on verse 6 for most of the sermon. Verse 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. What should we do with this verse? Now our temptation is to analyze it, to study it, to ask questions and to come up with answers to those questions. And and while there's a place to that for that, I'm afraid that if we do that right away, uh, we might actually evade the one who is speaking to us through this verse and we might miss the whole point, right? Uh, maybe the wrong question to ask is what should we do with this verse? Instead, we should ask, what does God want to do to us through this verse? Okay. What's the main point? What does God want from us? It says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Isn't it obvious that he, he's telling us to seek him, seek the Lord and call upon him, pray to him, confess your sins, ask to be saved and forgiven. That's what he wants. And in verse six, there's an added note of urgency, right? It's seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So there's urgency. It's it's a way of the of Isaiah telling us, do this now. Don't put it off. Okay? So that's the main point. I don't want any of us to miss it. Seek the Lord. Call upon him. It is absolutely urgent that we do so. Now, what are some of the questions we have about verse 6? It is okay to ask these questions and to study. I just don't want us to miss the main point and the one who's speaking to us. Okay? So I think the questions we have have to do with, you know, the second part of each phrase. Um, and it might lead us to ask, are there times when God may not be found? Are there times when God is not near? Okay, I think those are the questions we all have. Um, the Bible does teach that God is omnipresent. That means he is present everywhere at the same time. And so in, in that sense, he is always near, right? Um, he, he, he can always be found. Um, this verse is not contradicting that biblical teaching. So what, what is it getting at then? Why must, why the urgency? Why must we seek the Lord now while he may be found? Why must we call upon him now while he is near? Well, think of it this way. What, what might happen if we put this off? If we don't seek the Lord now, if we don't call upon his name and repent and pray to him now? Judgment day might happen, right? Christ could return today, tomorrow, any day, to judge the living and the dead. And when he comes in, in his glory with his holy angels for judgment, then it will be too late to seek him. It will be too late to call upon him and repent and ask for forgiveness, okay? You, you need to have done those things before Christ returns to judge the living and the dead. Another thing that can happen unexpectedly is death. We might die. And after we die, uh, the next you know, thing we will experience is the judgment. And um, it, again, it'll be too late after we die to seek the Lord to call upon his name. And we could, at, we could say even before we die, things could happen to us that would prohibit us or, or hinder us from seeking him and calling upon him, you know, our, our mental faculties could get reduced, could happen suddenly or gradually. You know, this is not to say that people with disabilities can't have a relationship with the Lord or people with Alzheimer's can't have a relationship with the Lord. I'm thinking primarily of, of coming to the Lord in initial repentance and faith. You, you want to do that before, <laughs> before your mental faculties go. Okay. Um, 
So those are two main things why there's urgency, judgment day and death. Um, but but even even if somehow we knew those things weren't going to happen for a long time, is, is there still unlimited time for us? Or, or does is that urgency still there? And I, I believe there is. Um, are all days and times equally alike? Uh, might a person be just as likely to seek the Lord now as they would be um, next Thursday afternoon? And, and I submit to you, no, that not all times are alike. Not there, there are some times in which it is more likely for us to seek the Lord and call upon him and repent and believe in him than others. Um, what, what am I talking about? Well, listen to these verses and see if you can... Uh, tell tell what I mean here. Romans ten seventeen. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Right, faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Here's another one. First Corinthians one twenty one. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Right. Through the folly of what we preach. That's how he saved people. 1 Peter 1.23 Since you have been born again through the living and abiding word of God. Born again through the word of God. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of God the heart. I believe you know what I'm getting at, right? Each of those verses have to do with the word of God, the word of Christ, the gospel. When the word is preached or when the word is open to you, even if you're just reading it on your own, that is the time. That is the opportune time when God, the Holy Spirit, will be working on you to, to, to cause you to seek him, to cause you to call upon his name. Now, the truth is, that none of us, you know, apart from the Spirit working through the Word, we put the Word down, we write, none of us can just all of a sudden seek the Lord. None of us can just all of a sudden think, oh, I need to call upon the Lord. That's just not how sinful, fallen humanity works. We're, we're so corrupt, we, we don't seek Him. We can't seek Him. We don't think to call upon Him. Instead, the Lord, the Good Shepherd, He needs to seek us out First, he needs to take the initiative, and he does that through the word being read or being preached. The Spirit works through that to then show us our sinfulness and cause us even to be terrified of his wrath and judgment. And then through the gospel, God God comforts us and consoles us and tells us there is salvation through, through, through the Son, Jesus Christ, who bled and died for your sins. Take refuge in him. Come to him. Repent and believe the gospel. Okay, so that that is why we, you know, next Thursday is not just as good as today because today, right now, you're hearing the preaching of the word. The word is being opened up to you. In addition to that, uh, we we don't know when Christ is returning. We don't know the day when we will die. Um, and and even before that, I want to talk about the word again. Uh, we we don't know whether or not we're gonna hear preaching of God's word again, okay? It, you know, and, and apart from the word, um, what, what are the things that occupy our minds? Well, there's so many things that occupy our minds and hearts that we get concerned about. You know, what are we having for dinner? Um, man, my back really hurts. Uh, when are the Vikings going to get their act together? Or how, how far will the twins go in the playoffs? Um, what about money? Am I going to have enough money to pay these bills or, or to retire when I want? And what about my children and my grandchildren? How are they doing? I'm concerned about them. You know, those are the things and, and hundreds of others that occupy our minds. We're really concerned about them. But but friends, it is especially when God's word is, is read, when we read it or when we hear preaching and teaching of God's word, that's when we really become uh, concerned about spiritual matters, about, you know, am I right with God? Am I going to be saved? And that, that's the opportune time to call upon the Lord, to seek him. Isaiah says that in verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Because he just got done preaching the gospel to them. If you look at chapter 55, verses 1 and 2, 
Uh, Isaiah says, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. This is, this is Isaiah preaching the gospel, to inviting people to come to God's uh, eternal heavenly wedding banquet, his feast, and, and it's absolutely free. He's inviting you to come. That's in verse 1. Now in verse 6, he's basically saying, this is the time to come. Don't put it off. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. The author of Hebrews puts it this way. Hebrews 4, 7. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. We'll go on. We spent about 10 minutes on verse 6. Now we're going to try to do the rest of the sermon text today. So Isaiah 55, verse 7. Isaiah continues, let, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Okay, so as we, this is really telling us, as we seek the Lord and as we call upon him uh, for salvation, God is, God is calling us to have this mindset or attitude of heart. That, that we, you know, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Um, this is a comprehensive call for repentance. It's, it's not just our ways, not just our actions, as important as, as our actions are, you know, the way we live our life. But God wants us to do this from the heart, to, to turn our wicked thoughts, to, I mean, to turn away from our wicked thoughts, and to begin to seek him with all our hearts and with all our minds. Um, I know when sometimes my kids fight, um, maybe you have kids and they fight too, right? <laughs> and and sometimes when they're fighting or being mean to each other, and it's especially heinous offense, I, I intervene and I, you know, separate them. I stop the fighting. And I, if I figure out there's one primary offender, I give that guy a, or girl a talking to, and then I tell that one to apologize. And they might begrudgingly say, I'm sorry. Or, I'm sorry, but I, I can tell, I can tell they don't really mean it from the heart, right? You know, as a, even though I want them to say sorry, I really want them to mean it from the heart. I want them to to regret being mean to that sibling that they made cry, and I want them to to desire not to do that again in the future. Okay, that's what I want for my kids, and I know they're gonna fight. They're kids. I know they're gonna be mean to each other. They're siblings, but. But, but on the whole, I want them to love one another and to feel bad when they hurt each other's feelings. And, and I know that's how God feels about us. That's what God wants for all of us. He does know we're weak. He does know we're frail and that we will sin as well, even after becoming Christians. But, but he wants our, our, thought, our ways and our thoughts to be oriented to him, such that when we stray from his ways uh, in, our, in our actions or in our words or in our thoughts, that, that we repent, that we ask him for forgiveness, and that we, 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 we want to do better. We, want, we ask him to change our ways as well. So this is not just actions. This is our, our whole inner life as well. We, so we ask God to change us from the inside out so that we can change our, turn away from our wicked ways and even our wicked thoughts. And verse 7 says, you know, let, let him return to the Lord so that he may have compassion on him. Let him return to our God, uh, for he will abundantly pardon. That's God's promise. When we return to him in repentance and faith, he will have compassion, he won't be angry, and he will forgive us our sins. Now, why does God forgive us of our sins? Now, given what I just said, you might think what well, he forgives us because we repent and we're sincere and we mean it from the bottom of our hearts. And while that's good, you know, he, he and while it's true that no one will go to heaven without repentance. I do want to say that the reason God forgives us ultimately is not because of our repentance, not because of our sincerity of heart. The reason why God forgives us sinners of our sins is because of what God's Son has done on our behalf. And we're in Isaiah 55. If you just turn the page backwards, probably one or two pages, you're in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, 4 through 6 is a prophecy about the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. 
It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That is the reason why God abundantly forgives us our sins. It's because the Lord, God the Father, has laid upon his Son the iniquity of us all. It's because on the cross, Jesus was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. And, and, and the punishment, the chastisement that was upon him has now brought us peace. Okay, that is why God, when we repent and believe in Jesus, that is why God is not angry with us. That's why he has compassion on us. That's why he will not hold any of our sins against us. He abundantly forgives us. And the reason is because Jesus Christ took our place, took our punishment upon the cross. Let's go on now to Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Again, so this is maybe a further uh, reason why we need to repent of our thoughts and ways. Back in verse uh, 7, it said, Let the wicked forsake his way, and let the unrighteous person forsake his thoughts. And here God is saying, Don't you know, my, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And so that's the reason why we need to, to you know, turn away from our wicked ways and, and get with the program, with God's program, to think his thoughts after him, and then to follow his ways. And this is true in everything. Uh, this is true in law and gospel. Just First of all, law. Law is God's commandments, his will. Now, there's some overlap, I think, with, with what God thinks is good and bad and what he wants people to do. And and what people naturally think is good and bad. I think everyone knows that murder is wrong and, and stealing is wrong and stuff like that. But there are a lot of commandments that, that we just, we wouldn't naturally follow or, or, or think we even should follow if it weren't for God revealing them to us in his holy word. And so, yes, we need to study God's word, his commandments, so, so that we can order our lives, order our ways according to God's ways. This is also true in regards to the gospel. Um, this is even more incomprehensible to us by nature. If, if, if you or I were to come up with a way for humans to, to be saved and to enjoy eternal bliss in heaven forever, we would likely all come up with a program where, you know, at the end our good, our good and bad deeds are weighed against each other and we'll see which one outweighs the other. And that would determine where we spend eternity. We'd all come up with something like that probably but but god instead he says you know i've looked at the human creatures that i've created and, and all of their scales are actually tipped like this so so far in 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 regards sin their, their sins far outweigh their good deeds they would all be damned they would all have to go to hell and suffer for their many sins of thought word and deeds but but this is what i've done i i have had mercy upon these dear human creatures that are lost and so I have sent my son Jesus into the world to save them, uh, to, to live a perfect and holy and righteous life. And then at the end of that life to offer up his body, his, his holy blood as a sacrifice to pay for all of their sins and then to rise again on the third day. And now every single sinner who, who trusts in Jesus, who believes in him and is baptized, is forgiven of their sins. Jesus' righteousness is given to them and I welcome them into my heavenly wedding feast absolutely free. It's simply through faith in Jesus. That's what God has come up with, and none of us ever would have come up with it. So so his His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And, and we, need, we need to study the Bible to get with God's program. Ultimately, we need the Holy Spirit. Through, through uh, belief in Jesus and baptism, God gives us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit then begins to give us uh, to renew our hearts and our minds so that we think God's thoughts after him and so that we begin to love what God loves and to hate what, what he hates. 
And I think that's the goal of sanctification is, is that we would be more and more like God and like his son, Jesus Christ. And so I pray that would be happening in, in each of our lives today. But I'll close with the main point again from verse six. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Amen.